Movies and TV shows based on video games are broadly regarded as trash on account of how, broadly speaking, they are trash. But a few have managed to rise above the rest, and even among those exceptions, Netflix and Frederator's Castlevania anime is particularly exceptional. In tone and atmosphere, character and plot, it's one of the best realized examples of dark fantasy in recent media memory, and makes for an entertaining watch whether you're a fan of the games or not. So when I heard that Netflix was producing another anime based on Capcom's bombastic last-gen action RPG Dragon's Dogma, a game I haven't had a chance to play for myself but which I've heard almost nothing but good things about, I couldn't help feeling a little hyped, especially after seeing the trailer. And for those of you who read this video's title, this is where the dramatic irony kicks in. Dragon's Dogma gave me a valuable reminder that building expectations based on association is a dumb recipe for disappointment. And that's just about the only thing of value it has to offer. This is a dime novel berserk knockoff without a single original idea to its name. Not even the ones that were in the game it took that name from. It even lifts its OP straight from Game of Thrones, so no into free for you, Dragon's Dogma fans, or know anything else you might have liked from the game. This anime is a very loose adaptation. From what I gather, the only part of the game's story it actually keeps is the basic premise. A dragon burns down a guy's village, tears out his heart to turn him into an undead arisen, and flies off, roaring, DEBATE ME BRO! Everything else is stripped out and replaced with Baby's first tabletop module. Also, they picked the name Ethan for the Arisen, and like, there's nothing wrong with that as a name. I just wouldn't choose it for a fantasy hero. Fear not, everyone! Ethan has arrived! Just sounds incredibly anticlimactic. Ethan is your basic, out-of-the-box, gruff, stoic, loner model of hero, who comes with a total of four mood settings. Polite, condescending, mad, and super saiyan mad and he doesn't get much use out of the first one. He's joined on his adventure feels really generous, so let's call it a long walk. Ethan's companion on his stroll to meet the dragon is an immortal servant with no will of her own called the pawn, one of the few other things the anime keeps from the game, kinda. He names her Hannah after the unborn child that was lost with his incinerated wife, and given how unsubtly datafied that is, you might expect their surrogate parental bond to be a major focal point of the narrative, but she's mostly just a walking Pokedex equipped with Zelda's light arrows and Fee from Skyward Sword's flat, logical personality. Those parents are starving themselves in order to fill their children's bellies. I noticed that. It didn't make sense. They are larger and require more nourishment. It was a foolish decision. You can probably guess where they go with that. Hannah learns to feel and becomes more human as Ethan loses his own humanity to his thirst for revenge. It's certainly an interesting idea for a character arc, but the show never really takes it past the idea stage to manifest the contrast between them as conflict. Now, a good setting can go a long way to make up for a weak script, and I've heard Dragon's Dogma is actually pretty great in that regard, but this anime totally rewrites its lore to be substantially less interesting. Even the motivation and purpose of the dragon changes, and that's like half the IP. As for the other half, there is a fuckload of dogma in this anime, but I don't think it's the right kind. Unless the original game was also an unbearably preachy reactionary evangelical screed that gets so high on its own neoliberal bootstrap bullshit it accidentally ends up endorsing feudalism. More on that later, though. The Dragon's Dogma anime is at least aesthetically faithful to its source, using the same creature designs as the game. It just completely changes the context surrounding those designs to be way more boringer. Take the goblins, for example. They have this cool, gnarled, thorny look to them, a distinctly metal visual take on the trope, in my opinion. And that uniqueness is reflected in their in-game lore, their evil tree root spirits who reproduce using underground blood rituals. Again, pretty metal. Compare that to the anime, where they are rapists. Because Goblin Slayer made a lot of money and... That's it. That's the whole reason. Look, I know some of you don't much like my take on Goblin Slayer, but I hope we can all at least agree that it's pretty lame to replace something that was unique with a cheap knockoff of that show's goblin gimmick. 
even worse, Dragon's Dogma somehow manages to make the original look tasteful by comparison. Yes, really. We will also get to that, and there will be a content warning when we do. Now, if you can ignore everything about the writing, the monsters do at least look as cool as they did in the game, almost like their models were lifted straight from the game, realistic shaders and all, with zero regard for how they'd look next to the cel-shaded human characters. In a vacuum, those also look pretty good, save for some decidedly awkward texturing and modeling in places. Those anchor arms ain't fooling anyone, Ethan. But when you put them together, it has the same weird dissonant effect as putting on the comic shaded costume in Insomniac Spider-Man. It just does not look right. If you can also ignore that, though, you'll find that the animation used to bring all of these models to life is unambiguously great, actually. Character movement is lively, bold, and believably weighty, with subtle touches like fingers flexing as they grab things and not so subtle but nonetheless fluid and personality-packed expressions. There's even full lip-syncing with the English vocals, oddly enough. So, you two are responsible for angering this Cyclops, huh? Something about sacrificing children just doesn't sit well with me. Those were actually recorded first, despite this being a Japanese production, I suppose in an effort to enhance the European fantasy vibe. They also got the whole cast together in one booth to record them, so the acting feels unusually reactive and natural for an anime. I only wish that I could say the same for the accents. The voice cast is entirely American, but someone told them all to sound British, which gives the production a palpable middle school Shakespeare vibe. I don't see it! I think we're- <laughs> It does get pretty funny when they bring in supporting actors who either couldn't do an accent or didn't get the memo. Like there's one drunk dude from California just randomly guarding this town in medieval England. We should really get going, Ethan. Guys like these obviously have more important things to do. Maybe we should lock you up too. Your job to teach the boy some goddamn respect. <laughs> Normally, when the English voice direction in an anime has a glaring flaw like this, it's not a big deal because you can just switch to the Japanese. But remember, the sub is a dub in this show. They based the lip movement on those English voices, so the Japanese audio track ends up being distractingly out of sync. Oi, Shimo, mo yamero. <laughs> There's just no fucking winning with this one, but at least the animation's good. Well, most of the time. When it is good, it's put to phenomenal use in the series fight scenes, which pit the Arisen and his pawn against some of the biggest, scariest monsters the original game had to offer. These battles look legitimately awesome, taking full advantage of the show's 3D nature to work in dynamic camera work, cool slow motion effects, and chaotic choreography that would be next to impossible to keep track of in a traditionally animated production. Now, there are a ton of other shows on Netflix with great fight scenes and good stories to go with them that perhaps deserve your attention more. Rise of the TMNT springs to mind. Also, Castlevania and Seis Manos actually manage to hit the tone that this series aims for and misses. But if you're a classic fantasy nerd who really just wants to vibe to a dude splitting Cyclops skulls, decapitating Hydras, and slicing up Skellingtons with no regard for narrative context, you might enjoy getting hammered and giving this a watch with your buddies. Of course, that's easier said than done nowadays, but today's sponsor, tuturu.tv slash basement, can help you bring anime night with the boys or girls or other back. Tuturu is a virtual browser service that allows you to share any streaming site, or any website in general for that matter, with anyone anywhere in the world. Be it mom and dad back home, a long-distance paramour you've been longing to Netflix and chill with, or the pals who share your passion for tearing apart terrible anime. Or watching normal good anime in a group together, I guess. 
weirdos. You can use Tutoru directly in your browser or download their lightweight desktop app, which is more responsive and includes a proxy function that allows you to browse like you were using your own connection. Tutoru is a startup, started, as you can probably guess from the name, by otaku for other otaku and built with sites like High Dive and Crunchyroll in mind. It's totally free, too, though there are wait times and time restrictions for free users. That said, their paid premium subscription costs just 5 bucks a month, or 50 annually, and allows you to skip login queues, browse without limits, and save your browser states and extension settings between sessions. Most importantly though, by subscribing, you'll be helping a small team of friends build something that the whole anime community can use, which is just cool. And if you use my link to subscribe, you'll also be supporting me, which is double cool. Head to tutoru.tv slash basement to sign up today and bring your anime nights back tonight. Now on the other hand, if narrative context is something you care about, like even a little bit, you would be hard pressed to find a less fulfilling way to spend your time than Dragon's Dogma. It is, without question, one of the most basic, unimaginative, and unappealing fantasy stories ever penned. Your average teenage first-time dungeon master could cook up less predictable uh, activities than these. Like, stop me if you've heard this one before. In episode two, Gluttony, as our heroes journey through the woods, they stumble upon a young maiden chained to a rock, waiting to be devoured by a... Okay, maybe don't stop me just yet, I do have a point to make here. They rescue the girl and take her home, but whoops, her parents are pissed actually, because she was supposed to be a sacrifice to appease the rampaging cyclops that's been terrorizing their town. Food is scarce with the monsters stopping all hunting, a situation made all the worse by the mayor and his lackeys imposing heavy levies on the peasantry in exchange for protection from the beast, so the only reliable way to get enough to eat for the winter is to sacrifice a child. Now, having heard that premise, do you want to maybe take a crack at guessing the twist in this story? I'll give you a sec. If your answer was, the fat guy and the cyclops are in cahoots, congratulations! It was a big bamboozle all along. Because you see, if the villagers are scared of a monster that the town guards have consistently failed to do anything about, and also starving because that monster is stopping them from getting food, they'll be more willing to give up the food they do have in taxes? I don't think screenwriter Kurasumi Tsunayama really thought that plot through. Probably because he was over-eager to get to the ham-fisted and frankly baffling parable at the end of it. After Ethan beats up the Cyclops, he drags Mayor Harkonnen into town to be judged by his people. And then we smash cut to the castle on fire and Ethan crying in despair? In a flashback, we see that after stoning the bad guy, all the starving peasants stormed the castle and started tossing stuff around and also punching each other over the food, I guess. And some of the kids really stuffed their faces with it. Like, geez, learn some table manners. Then a book got stepped on. That de-escalated quickly? But it still leaves Ethan crying manly tears, and the moral of it all appears to be that if you pull the beleaguered masses out from under the weight of a self-evidently corrupt system, they'll immediately transform into greedy, violent, selfish dickholes, damage property, and burn down historic buildings. Which is almost as bad, morally speaking, as making people starve for your own personal benefit. At least if Ethan's reaction is anything to go by. Now, of course, that is just one episode out of seven, so it's unfair to assume this incredibly dumb moral is representative of the story's themes as a whole. In a later episode, Ethan does put forward a pretty sensible argument for uplifting folks who've worked hard and gotten shafted by the system after a bunch of soldiers are slaughtered in the process of slaying a gold hoarding lich. While their surviving commanders agonize over how the families of the fallen will go destitute without their salaries, our hero proposes divvying up a bit of the vast vault of treasure among themselves to help those families out. Your efforts and the efforts of your men deserve rightful compensation. If the Duke is so greedy that he won't do that, take matters into your own hands. Nothing unreasonable about that, right? 
Who's going to miss a few sacks of gold from a Scrooge McDuck pool that nobody's seen for a hundred years? Well, this self-righteous dipshit seems to disagree. Where's your honor? We are soldiers. We live by a code. Without it, we're no better than common rogues. I don't know, dog. Doesn't seem very honorable to me to let veterans and their families wither and die after the state has used them up. But that is just, like, my opinion, man. And the show seems to think he's right. You see that gold coin Ethan's holding up in front of his right eye? That's the cursed magic coin that possessed the priest of the church therein and turned him into the insatiably greedy lich they just killed. The second the noble knight commander Balthazar touches it, he instantly heel turns and stabs his best friend to death to get at the gold. Zero hesitation. The implication of this shot is that even Ethan's extremely tame argument for more equitable wealth distribution than literally feudalism is in fact the corrupting influence of the demonic embodiment of greed itself. Dragon's Dogma seems to believe that if you get ahead without following the rules, even if they're self-evidently unfair rules that humanity replaced centuries ago because they're bad, that is inherently evil. And if it sounds like I'm reaching, just listen to this demonically possessed man speak in tongues. The world is a complicated place, Simon. It's not black and white like you think it is. Those in power want to stay in power, and in order to do that, they have to keep us down. You sound like the lich. Is this show secretly based on one of those fabled, rejected Ben Shapiro screenplays? That would explain the recurring theme of unsatisfied wives. On that note, it's about time for that content warning I warned you guys about earlier. I'm gonna try to keep this as light as possible, but just be aware that from here on out, we will have to discuss in some detail sexual assault and violence against women. Because this is the juvenile Tolkien but with titties and blood kind of dark fantasy. Episode 3 opens with Ethan and Hannah rushing to the aid of some strangers beset by goblins, and inside of a minute of the encounter starting, the lady with them, Elizabeth, is on the ground being groped. And where Goblin Slayer was at least plausibly ambiguous in whether it was going for ill-timed fan service or just overly lurid horror, the sole goal of this scene seems to be to put Elizabeth's jiggling jubblies on screen as much as humanly possible. I get it, Shinya Sugai. The animators you were directing worked super hard on those soft body physics and nipple normal maps, and you just want people to see the melons of their labor. But there's a time and place to appreciate anime titties. Most times and places can be for titty appreciation. And you pick the one that definitively should not. It's not like you couldn't have waited to get horny. She takes him out again to cuck her husband in like four minutes. Yes, thankfully this episode's plot isn't really about the gross goblins, they're just kinda there. Less thankfully, it is about Elizabeth trying to jump Ethan's bones because the guy she married for his money is a total wimp and she's a total fight slut. Like, her pupils visibly dilate an indication of arousal while she's watching Ethan turn goblins into blood pinatas. And she doesn't even let that blood dry before pressing her bare boobs up on him. This lady's got some issues. That said, her husband, Theo, has some volumes. At first, he comes off as being unusually mature and understanding about her disinterest in him when he catches her coming on to Ethan, acknowledging that he wasn't strong enough to protect her and vowing to become the man she deserves. Elizabeth, wait. What? I... The man I deserve has a backbone. I... But that only makes what happens next make even less sense than it would otherwise. Which is none. A griffin attacks the group out of nowhere, and while the big strong men are busy fighting it off, the goblins come back and surround Theo and Elizabeth. With no choice but to fight, he mans up and just starts stabbing the shit out of the little guys. I mean, he really goes to town on them. And he gets so caught up in the heat of the moment that after they're all dead, while his wife is praising him for his bravery, he stabs the shit out of her too, so she can never leave him. But, of course, 
He already did the thing that he needed to do to keep her, murder. And when he realizes that, gripped by remorse, he stabs himself too. It's just like one of my Brittany's Shakespeare's. Well, that's what they were going for on paper, but in practice it happens so fast and with so little justification that he just ends up coming off as a completely unbelievable psychotic dipshit. This is, hands down, one of the dumbest story beats I've ever seen in anything. And Elizabeth manages to make it even dumber. Because instead of rightly cussing him out for getting her killed with his ungodly stupidity, you know, the one outcome she was so scared of that it drove her into the arms of another man, she uses her dying breath to reaffirm her devotion to her murderer. You didn't have to do this. I was always yours. This illogical misogyny isn't an isolated incident, either. In case this hasn't been made clear enough already, Dragon's Dogma seems to hate all human beings, but its scorn is not distributed equally, and it gives its few female characters an especially raw deal. Most of them aren't even characters, really. Women in this show are more or less exclusively used as disposable props that exist to be killed, hurt, or endangered for the motivation of a nearby man. The closest to an exception is Hannah the Human Pokedex, who does some fighting and has just barely enough agency to remind Ethan to eat, sleep, and calm down a bit. Pawns also have a healing factor, so she can't actually die or be permanently injured to drive his character forward, but we do find that out when she gets decoy yeeted by a monster in order to push him into Super Saiyan Mad mode for the first time. So, yeah, she's not handled super well, but the show does a lot worse. Besides Hannah, you've got Ethan's dead wife Olivia, whose character traits are loving Ethan, like, for years, literally from the moment they met as children she had a crush on him, and that's the only backstory she's ever given, and, uh, she's nice to orphans? Also she's dead, obviously, you can't do a vengeance without a thing to avenge after all. After Olivia, we meet the Cyclops Snack, Cyclops Snack's mom, and her future Cyclops Snack, Emoto, they're, uh, Poor, which gives the man of the house something to agonize over, and they don't get many lines. We've already covered the fight slut who gets murder-suicided by her husband, but while we're on the subject, there's also a literal succubus that takes the form of Ethan's wife so he can brutally strangle her to death with her tits out. Did you honestly expect better? Demonstrating how far he's fallen before the finale. And that covers literally all of the women characters in this show save for one who is given some degree of autonomy, in that she worries about her whole village in addition to the man she's attached to. She appears in episode 4, the plot of which can be summarized thusly. <clears throat> drugs are bad, okay? And if you do drugs, you're bad, okay? Because drugs are bad. Oh shit, run, it's a Hydra! In slightly more detail. While wandering through an abandoned mountain village, Ethan and Hannah run into a kindly, earnest girl named Lenny, who takes them to a nearby cave where the villagers have holed up in fear of the dragon. There, they meet Yang, Lenny's, uh, actually rewatching this episode, it appears that Sunayama didn't bother to define what these characters' relationship actually is. Yang calls her love, and she's clearly bothered about him sleeping with other girls, but not that bothered? I thought they were a husband and wife on the rocks my first time through, and she was just putting up with it because that's what the village is like, but they could just as easily be brother and sister, or just childhood friends? All I can say for sure is that, in a very vague and broad sense, Yang is some form of Lenny's man, and he spends all his time baked out of his gourd on psychoactive cave moss, which, as Lenny tells us, is the main export of this village. Or, to be more accurate, labor camp, since the local lord was forcing all the villagers to harvest the moss for him until the dragon appeared, hence why most of them ran away. Except for the younger ones, who don't know the outside world and thus decided to stay back and get high. Because the moss uh, makes food and sex better, apparently, and also makes it feel like your dreams are coming true. You can really tell that this was written by someone who's never been high or even talked to someone who has, but hasn't let that stop them from having very strong opinions on the subject. 
On that note, the other important thing about this moss is it's so wickedly addictive that everyone who smokes it falls into a lethargic stupor that leads to either death or disaster. So that Yang boy had better stop smoking before something bad happens. He doesn't, of course, and when Ethan and Hannah end up waking a Hydra sleeping deep in the cave that then charges back to attack the village, he's barely able to stumble away from its looming jaws. That is, until Lenny sacrifices herself to save him, but don't worry, when he nuts up and helps to fight the monster a little bit, the man earns his damsel back. She didn't have to die for his sins after all. She's only permanently blinded by stomach acid. And now she gets to be dependent on him forever. There you have it. That's the best ending this show gives any female side character. <laughs> but I would like to quickly loop back to the sin Lenny's sacrificed for, because Sloth is definitely the episode where this show's preachy bullshit hits its absolute peak. Like everything in Dragon's Dogma, drug use and addiction is presented as a black and white issue here, a moral failing that always results in self-destruction. Nobody smokes in moderation to deal with pain or just relax when they're not working. You're either an upstanding citizen who successfully performs his role in society, or a useless wasteoid who gets high literally all the time. Ironically, the show itself is pretty slothful in its own preaching on this issue. In response to Lenny's argument that the world kinda blows and there's nothing wrong with doing what you can to escape that on occasion, Ethan literally just names a logical fallacy. <sighs> that's a slippery slope. But that's not quite the low point of the episode. Shortly thereafter, while speculating about whether or not Lenny might want to sabotage their journey to stop the Lord from returning and putting them back to work, he follows that up by saying, maybe the single stupidest thing I've ever heard an anime protagonist say. And that includes people die when they are killed. If the Lord and his men return, the villagers would be forced back into labor. They would no longer be able to imbibe in the moss, which would be good in a way. Could this show possibly get any more brain dead? Yes. The final episode is all about fighting that dragon, and I should note up front that I have a very personal beef with this fire-breathing fucker. When thou peers into the dark, the dark peers into thee. I hate it when fantasy stories try to half-ass Shakespearean prose by sprinkling thee's and thou's into otherwise conventional dialogue, but that's shockingly the least of the writing problems here. As a boss fight, the dragon's pretty much what you'd expect. Ethan and Hannah run around dodging its fire for a bit and hitting it where they can, it flies into the sky with Ethan on its tail, and he scales its uh, scales to stab it, and when they get back to the ground, he finishes it off in a final desperate attack. It looks cool, even if it's not at all imaginative. The real problem is that the dragon's stated philosophy and explanation for why it made the plot happen, the whole point that all of this has been leading up to, makes no goddamn sense. Throughout the battle, the dragon spends a good amount of time lecturing Ethan about how humans are inherently sinful creatures driven to their own destruction by their needs, like food and sex. In contrast, while Ethan thinks the dragon killed his family for its own amusement, that's actually just a thing dragons do for literally no reason. It's just a condition of them existing. As a fish swims through water, a dragon swims through corpses. Or to use the dragon's analogy, Asking me not to is tantamount to asking you not to breathe. One small problem with that, Breathing is a need. If we don't do it, we die. But the dragon doesn't need to kill humans. It's not hungry. It doesn't even find the killing entertaining. It just does it because. The central motivation behind seven episodes of terrible anime is... Yeah, I just felt like it. Even SAO's golly, I forgot why I did it cop-out feels more satisfying than that. Well, okay, there's a little more to it on the lore side. 
See, the dragon used to be a human, an arisen like Ethan who killed the last dragon and took its place. As it turns out, any arisen who kills a dragon for the sake of revenge commits a sin of pride and becomes a dragon himself. That's why Ethan's superpower was getting really angry, because that's the sin I associate with that. And this creates a cycle of misery that will only end if someone can put aside their personal beef with the dragon and do the objectively necessary murder in the right frame of mind, I guess. Ethan does it wrong and starts to lose control of himself, so he asks Hannah to kill him before he transforms. But tragically, by this show's very low standards anyway, she just can't do it because he taught her how to feel instead of be logical. And so, with the last of his humanity, Ethan resists killing her off and flies off, telling her to protect the foolish humans from him. And that's how this anime ends, with the most literal interpretation of those who hunt monsters are destined to become monsters themselves possible. Subtlety is not this anime's strong suit but neither is anything else. So where does that leave us with the dragon? Why'd he kill Ethan's wife specifically and choose him to be turned into an Arisen? Because being a dragon sucks and the dragon wanted to die and Ethan just happened to be there at the moment he became self-aware. Why me? I don't understand. It matters not that you understand. What matters is that it's real. This whole anime was just an extremely convoluted, impulsive suicide attempt. And it fucking feels like it, but you may have noticed a problem with that explanation, which is that it doesn't actually answer the question being asked, and in fact, just deflects from it. We still don't know why people turn into giant, flying, fire-breathing lizards that are instinctually driven to kill human beings in the first place. We don't know what the purpose of the dragons or this mystical cycle even is, unless the anime is following the game's lore, which it really doesn't seem to be. So I guess that leaves me to piece it together for myself. Okay, let's try this. As far as I can tell, the dragon's cosmological purpose is to make people suffer, because people are naturally evil and they deserve to have terrible things happen to them out of nowhere. Which I guess makes some sense if you define evil as breaking literally any rule to make your life even a little better ever. Take that together with the lazy Seven Deadly Sins theme that this show definitely didn't just borrow from Berserk and make worse and more obvious, and it's not that much of a leap to say that the dragon's meant to be a sorta vengeful Old Testament god type figure. And Ethan does tell his surrogate daughter to protect those foolish humans from me. Also, she dies and comes back to life in a cave, so I guess Hannah's pawn Jesus? Did I really just pull out my anime analysis decoder ring only to find a crummy basic Bible allegory? Everyone is awful and the world is a fuck, but Hannah will save everyone someday? I don't know, maybe I'm reaching with that. The writing in this series is really bad, so not everything lines up, even if that was what they were going for. But thinking about it is making my head hurt, and this anime thinks humans don't need to breathe, so it's definitely not worth trying any further. If that is the ultimate moral of this story, y'all motherfuckers need Jesus, I don't think that's very satisfying personally, but fuck it, I guess it beats slavery is better than doing drugs. If it seems like I've spent too much of this roast flaming a moral philosophy that I happen to disagree with, well, first off, my main complaint is that the delivery of those moral messages is just shitty and annoying, but more importantly, that's kinda all there is to this show. If you strip away the puritanical preaching, all you're left with are decent fight scenes strung together by the most bare-bones RPG storyline imaginable. The hero's hometown is burned by a villain, and everyone he loves dies, so he sets out to stop that villain from d d doing stuff. In his travels, he and his companion find a corrupt mayor of a neighboring town is using a monster to control his people, so they stop that guy. 
Later, out on the road, our heroes and some other traveling knights have a literal random encounter with some goblins and a griffin. Then they take a shortcut through a cave, only to find there's a boss monster at the end of it. To escape the rain, our heroes take refuge in a seemingly abandoned church. Oh no, zombies! And now they gotta fight the zombies with those knights from before. But one of the knights becomes a zombie, and they both die. While resting in an inn, a deadly succubus attacks the party, so they kill it. Then, at short last, our hero reaches the villain's lair and takes his revenge. But surprise! Revenge is bad, actually, and the hero has become exactly that which he sought to destroy. Now, there's nothing wrong with formulaic, cliched plotting in and of itself. Well-developed characters and resonant themes can do a lot to elevate otherwise predictable stories. And that's exactly why this story's pathologically misanthropic, reactionary worldview is such a problem for it. There's no believable humanity in it. Its cynical base assumptions about our species are just self-evidently untrue. Real people don't just go from zero to frenzied neighbor-assaulting riot, or zero to wife murder, or zero to junkie, or hero to gold-hoarding best friend murdering monster the second they're met with the tiniest temptation. And when every emotional beat and underlying theme of this story hinges on highlighting this deeply unrealistic, as the dragon so unsubtly put it, the darkness of the human. The whole piece rings hollow. There's just nothing to get attached to here. And that is a huge shame because from everything I've seen of it putting together this video, the world that they didn't bother to adapt from the game does seem pretty damn cool. And it's clear that a lot of genuinely talented artists and animators worked hard on this show, even if there was no cohesive leading vision to pull all that work together. On a technical level, there's nothing holding Dragon's Dogma back from being a good or even great video game adaptation. But the soul of the thing is just shriveled, rotten, and ugly. If you're looking for something better to watch, ReZero actually handles its horror and fantasy themes well, and has infinitely more of value to say about the human condition and our struggles to overcome our fears and vices to do good. I just put out a big ol' video essay exploring its exploration of solitude that's one of the best things I've ever written. Also, Yazzie and I have started a new podcast, if you haven't seen that yet. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement. <laughs>